Hey, Andrew, welcome back. Oh, my gosh. It's good to be back. Good to see you, Adam. Yeah. Uh, now, now to see how well you are prepared. So when you was when you was the last time at Airhex FM, you remember that? It was. I think I think that was just soon after I had joined Apple. Yeah, when was it? Year. Um, that would have been um, early pandemic. That's, yeah, it's like spring or summer of 2020. Yeah, yeah. J- July yeah. 2020. Mm-hmm. Crazy how time flies. Two, yeah. two years. Good to see you now, though. Yeah, um, so you were at Apple. So what you did oh, well. at Apple? Well, at Apple, we were, we were starting up the open source program office there, which was was great. It was a recognition that, that Apple has been reliant on and contributing to open source. And we, we launched up a program there to be supportive of those efforts, both, in, both internally and not. And uh, I was looking after our public-facing programs. And you know, probably the biggest effort there was to get opensource.apple.com relaunched. And it's still out there now. Open source.apple.com. Okay, this mm-hmm. is one of your achievements. With with many other people and a, and a whole team, but yeah, we we do what was called the DRI model. It's like a directly responsible individual. So that was that was mine to make sure we got across the finish line for certain. Okay, yeah, great news. Uh, and and was it successful? Or I mean, uh, it's hard to measure, right? So it was. Everyone... It was. Yeah, it was wild to me, like how successful it was because you know it was it's just a website effort, right? Like th- these are not the most complicated of, of projects, but um, Apple was a, was a great time because it shows to me like how, how like comprehensive they are when, when they do um, like looking at what it is to bring a project out and bring it to market and how many people end up get, get having the chance to give input and making sure that works. And when we launched it, um, that's, a, that's a massive megaphone. That's a huge platform. When Apple does something, people listen and it matters. And for us to make a statement about open source, what mattered too. So, like the, the response to that was was amazing. It was immediately picked up by press. It was immediately picked up by folks on Twitter, and there were some really great stories that came out of it. I heard that there were like some undergrad launch parties to like to watch the launch of this and to to follow it. Like folks who were an undergrad and cared about open source. That was really cool. I got to meet so many people from the community who like came out and they were supportive of this. It was it was a really great project to be working on. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I open now the open source at Apple.com. And uh, yeah. so you know there's Swift, Kubernetes, uh, WebKit. Yeah. And a lot more. Foundation DB, okay, great database, care kit, research kit, service talk, core ML tools, Swift, Nio, and uh, oh Apache Cassandra. Mm-hmm. That's interesting how yeah. Apple is related to uh, maybe maybe they're contributing to Cassandra, right? Mm-hmm. Solar, Netty, Apache Traffic Server, interesting. Uh, Spark, Container D, Solar. And uh, yeah, so this was like, you know, um, making the um, visible what, where Apple contributes, right? Yeah, it was, it's where Apple is consuming and contributing to and helping to like, you know, bring prominence to those projects that are really part of like the essential parts of the infrastructure supply chain for Apple and for many other companies. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But now you are no more at Apple, right? Correct. Not for um, over a year now. Over a year. I know it. <laughs> Crazy. Okay, what are you doing right now? I mean, now like I'm I'm super excited to be where I am. Now. This, what we're working on is, is amazing. I work over at Block. Block is a company that many people know of as Square. Um around a little over a year ago, Block rechanged from from um from Square to Block. And I work in one of our business units now. That's one of our emerging, like our emerging business units. It's called TBD, uh-huh. and um, our job is to bring forth the decentralized web and to do it in a way that is going to bring economic empowerment to people. I think there's a tremendous amount of promise that's happening right now in emerging crypto communities. I don't think it's there yet. And what we're doing is we're looking at the foundational pieces that are necessary of a decentralized web that bring people ownership over their data, that help us to share information in a private way, but give us the opportunity to make sure that we're hanging on to things that should not just be given to other stewards, and also to transact across country boundaries with minimal effort. And when you start to take a look at like the global financial system right now, you see it's it's a predatory lending model right now to send to send money. It's it's like amazingly prohibitive. It's through lack of access. It's through overwhelming fees, 
And these are some of the things that we can talk about today. But the, the global financial system right now just does not work for transacting across country boundaries. And this impacts so many people and leaves them out of the economy. So we're working on those solutions that make that decentralized, that make that fast, and that can bring across digital money to real people and fix real problems. You said you had Square, which is yeah. called Block right now. Yes. There's some interesting Java story in Square. You know it, right? Mm-hmm. No? Well, you tell me which one day you refer to. There's a lot. <laughs> There's a Square Crazy Bob Lee, right? The Crazy Bob Lee was a uh, part of the uh, of Square, and he implemented the dependency injection, which mm-hmm. was oh, compatible yeah. with Ad Injector. Remember that? Oh, yeah. I remember, I remember when like Bob was working on that. I think it was even closer to when he was like, it might have even been when he was still doing like Android stuff at Google. Um, but yeah, I remember that that whole like the CDI spec could come out of like stuff that Gavin King was working on when we were over at Red yeah, Hat exactly. too, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and I remember the whole debate about like, is it you know, is it just an annotation set or is it also come with a whole bunch of like functionality specified and not? And like, yeah, that was a big debate. That was a big debate. I remember that because at the time I was working on EJB three as well, right? So like exactly. EJB three one was what also had its own annotation set. And when CDI was coming on the scene, it was like you know, how do we reconcile these these kind of like two programming models in one platform? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And how was it called? You know, there was the the very thin uh, uh, dependency injection framework back then. It was uh, it was like it was not Dagger. It was one before, you remember that? Where you have to you know bind the input always to the interfaces, or you have to explicitly configure it. You, you said, you know, uh, bind uh, interface to input. And, and, and Crazy Bob was, I think, this was the implementation. There was a book also from A-Press, I think, the Black Book. Oh, my gosh. Um, I have to look it up. I forgot just the name. Like the history like, here, know. yeah, the history here gets murky for me because it was a time where, like, you know, content, like dependency injection was such a hot thing. So like definitely at, at JBoss we had our own we, like we had our own kind of like injection frameworks. There was Juice, I mm-hmm. think a lot of that Juice. stuff. Oh, is that what you're talking about? Like Google's Juice? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. This is I think where uh, where also a, a Bob Lee contributed, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, there was I think CDI, if I'm remembering correctly, was kind of like a convergence of ideas that were like prototyped out in the world through like the very successful Juice framework as well as. Gavin stuff in Seam because Gavin had like he had done sure in dependency injection, but also put a lot of work into thinking about like scoping of things. So um, in Seam, there was this notion of um, like um, a conversation scope, mm-hmm. which was really important for for like the development of this framework in the web because we had like application scope every app had and request scope that was easy enough. But like conversation scope, the idea that like you could just build in a conversation with met like many requests in one user session, but like not binding it to the user session itself. So they could have like many conversations happening from like, you know, if you have two tabs open, that's the same user, but like there's two conversations. I remember mm-hmm. that being like very influential mm-hmm. and part of it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm looking right now and Google Juice is still popular, 12,000 stars. Oh, cool. And it's uh, still Java team. So it's not that active, but it's still something going on. So interesting that choose, you know. Um, yeah, I, I just, um, I think Crazy Bob was later at, at, at Square. And he started, I think, at, at Google, right? Where he created a Juice. And Juice was one of the implementation. And of course, a Weld was your JBoss, the another one. And Juice was like the very simple one. I think Juice didn't have any scopes, right? It was like, you know, just binding and, 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 CD, and Weld brought this the this the, the scopes but yeah, if you, really. you said you know square i immediately thought you know about crazy bob lee and i also remember he's he was swimming to alcatraz or something for san francisco crazy <laughs> yeah this was like you know true? yeah yeah uh, interesting so and now you have working for the company you know this was the the historical java shop mm-hmm. and hopefully all your web3 stuff is pure java right no no <laughs> no no, is... no. <laughs> <laughs> Like we recognize that like like Java and the enterprise is still huge and we've got to have connections. We we actually have put together a platform, we're calling it Web5. Mm-hmm. And like we're doing that for like a, a few reasons. But like one one is to say like the parallels I see with Web5, the things that I think are so amazing about it, are some of the same lessons that we picked up, um, you and I both in being involved in enterprise Java. Like mm-hmm. just the very notion that complex development is complicated. And being an engineer of that is ridiculously difficult. Um, and like, you know, in, in the Java enterprise world, that was things like 
the, the security model and the transactions model and the threading and all of this, like you just fundamentally want to write your business logic. And I even extended this when, when I started Arkillion. Mm-hmm. If you remember going back, like that was a test platform that let you just write your test logic. And the Arkillion test harness was doing things like starting up servers, taking care of deployment, collating the results, like all of this other cross-cutting nonsense that you just don't want to do. Um was the success of like the Java Enterprise Edition and Archillion for us and Weld mm-hmm. and like think of any other framework, right? Like their job is to do something to make your job as a developer easier. And that's what I see in Web5 right now, mm-hmm. right? That is, a, that is a programming model for the decentralized web and make no mistake, um, programming for decentralized applications is remarkably more difficult than it is for centralized ones. And it's more difficult than the grand challenge of maybe the past decade, which has been making things cloud native. So Web5 so, is a product. Yeah. <clears throat> Web5 is a project. Web5 is our open source project that contains the primitives that you need to build decentralized applications. It contains a data layer, a messaging model, um, a protocol for which those messages, you know, like the format of those, those messages are sent. Uh, a mechanism for sending those messages in a decentralized way and making sure they get to where they need to be, um, as well as what we call an SSI model, a self-sovereign identity model, which bakes a notion of real identity into the web. And that, that's been a missing layer of the web this whole time. We've been giving our identity to, to big providers. This gives us a way to be sovereign over our own identity and to share that with people as well. And that's all baked into the Web5 programming model. De- a decentralized identity, right? Mm-hmm. Decentralized identity, yeah. Mm-hmm. So it will be like, you know, um, a, a Git, Git with your data, right? You know, honestly, it's the paradigm is exactly what we do when we carry physical versions of our identity. It's mm-hmm. something we're already familiar with. Like if you think like right now, um, I might go to a supermarket Mm-hmm. <laughs> right, I'm from the U.S. We have big supermarkets, you know, regular markets, right? And they may want to give me like a customer like value card or something. That's something they give to me and I hold in my wallet. Mm-hmm. And when I want to show someone else that I've got this, I, I just give it to them. And it's the same way with passports and driver's licenses and other forms of government ID. It's the same way with Adam. If you want to like make a statement about me and say that like, you know, we're friends, you can do that. I hold all that information and that's what the self sovereignty is to me. It's me holding it in my wallet. And we do this in the physical world already. We're used to it. And and the difference is with the digital realm, what this lets us do is instead of having a card with a hologram or some sort of anti tampering stuff on there, we're able to digitally sign it. So Uh if you want to make a statement about me, go right ahead, make that statement sign it, and then I'm going to hang on to it. And now when I show that to anyone else, they may or may not believe the content in there, but they can decide whether they trust you. And they but can this decide- is like a Git commit, right? This is like Merkle tree. So if you know the, the, the last commit, is a mm-hmm. chain of all commits and everything is signed. So if you have you know, the hash of the last commit in Git, you already know, you know that whatever happened before is just like, it happened because uh, this is a chain of hashed values. Um, for self-sovereign identity, they're they're all independent. Like it's not like we've put them on a blockchain ah, okay. and we're like signing the last thing. It's like each each piece of that information is just it's a piece of JSON, right? Mm-hmm. Um, thankfully, not a piece of YAML. Um, <laughs> it's a piece of JSON that's got some data and then has been digitally signed, and that is an independent piece of data that you just hang on to. So, like JSON Web Token, more or less. Mm-hmm. That's exactly no. That's part of it. It's part of the spec. Absolutely. It's oh, very verifi- good. Yeah, it's called the verifiable credential spec, and it references JSON. Oh, um, what what I thought is no, mm-hmm. this is identity with my history. So what I thought about is uh, decentralized web. What I could do is um, I could maintain, yeah. for instance, a list of my social graph or followers, and you know, mm-hmm. take with me between you know uh, Twitter and Mastodon mm-hmm. and, and GitHub or whatever, something like this. Yeah, I mean, and that's what's beautiful about this too is because because Web five is all message based, and because it's like up for people to extend that protocol, we then get an application layer above it. So, you know, for us, in the case of TBD, what what we care about is making a decentralized exchange called TBDEX. And that's so that people can exchange assets of value over this network. But if you're making a social, if you're making a social network, 
that's up for you to make that application layer protocol above the transport protocol for of okay. Web Five, so, right? So, um, so if you go to Web Five, it's the yeah. platform. So it will be similar to let's say Whitefly, right? So you said already there is a like a messaging mm -hmm. layer, so it will be similar yeah. to GMS. Yeah. So I could mm -hmm. send messages somewhere. Yeah. And um, do I have to address another server or how it is done? So let's say I would like to send a message somewhere. How to address the message? So is the message like I have to use I don't something like I, I mean IP address something similar or or uh, the identity you mentioned or how to how the route, routing between nodes is working? Yeah. So I mean this and this is like why it is so difficult to do this on your own, right? <laughs> Because that's that's like probably the crux of the problem. If you're an application developer and you want to make a decentralized application, mm -hmm. that also kind of infers that you've got to make a decentralized network and figure out how you're going to route stuff through there. Uh, mm -hmm. Web5 is going to handle that for you. Um, and and then the thing that's that's up to you really is when you're granting permission to get like access to these messages, it's done based on something called the DID. It's a decentralized identifier. And you can mm -hmm. think about that as like the identifier that identifies you and all of your pieces of identity on the internet. Um, and that's that's like the one thing we use the blockchain for. We want to like anchor that on the blockchain because it has to be discoverable. And that's where we like actually do need the rigidity of the blockchain. That's where like the expense is worth it. To like anchor your DID on there, but that's it. We like slim it down to exactly that case. So unlike in Web3 or NFTs where like all of the information is being placed on the blockchain, here most of the information is being centralized with you in your wallet. That's that's where you can hang on to it and, and held on to mm -hmm. in a piece of technology called your decentralized web node. So, um, um, so uh, blockchain was supposed to be, you know, decentralized, but it was actually more or less centralized so and, and you are saying you are more decentralized than the blockchain right but i don't i don't think i would say that, that the blockchain technologies are centralized i mean mm -hmm. it really depends on the topology with which you're you're deploying them right like you could you mm -hmm. could have a you could have a centralized blockchain if you wanted to a lot of people have internal like blockchains right exactly mm -hmm. but you know with a with a wide network public facing one i think that one is sufficiently decentralized but the problem with it is like The same problem that we used to talk about when we came to relational database management systems versus NoSQL or whatever. Like, if, if you want these things and all of the like crazy guarantees that they provide, which like let's make no mistake, like in the world of data storage, the blockchain is the most rigid form of storage we have available to us on planet Earth. If something is on there in a sufficiently distributed, like you know, decentralized blockchain architecture, you can basically bet your life that the information contained there is true mm -hmm. or at least or at least is valid or like accurate to this to the whole system um and with that comes a remarkable expense right like there's time to settle that across the entire blockchain network there are like mm -hmm. layered solutions to it so when i look at that and i say like okay where where do you need that rigidity where do you need all of that security and how, mm -hmm. like, where are you willing to pay the price that corresponds to running all of that infrastructure? And like, mm -hmm. it turns out the answer is like, you, you need that rigidity in a very small amount of cases and you don't need it to have every single transaction on there or every piece of data about you on there. If I want to send you a message, Adam, I don't think that message should have to go itself on a blockchain. Mm -hmm. We should be anchoring our IDs there and we should be using that for referential integrity. And the message itself can go over a network and reach you and then you can store that in whatever mechanisms that, that you'd like. And we don't need to put that in a blockchain. Exactly. And, and, and you are only using a blockchain for what? For? For anchoring the DIDs. Mm -hmm. For, for exactly. anchoring, so this for is anchoring just the for... identity, yeah. But, ah, okay. So you're using the blockchain to distribute the DIDs, right? Mm-hmm. This is the, so you are using blockchain like a, more or less like a registry, right? Yeah, just for the DIDs, yeah. And, and like the specs, you would look into that for like for decentralized identifiers. I mean, decentralized identifiers were approved by the W3C as a, as a proper scheme. So that's mm -hmm. great. We can use that. Uh, verifiable credentials are part of the verifiable credentials working group. And then um, other technologies like decentralized web node that, that lives within... Um, The Decentralized Identity Foundation, DIFF, which is a subgroup over of like Linux Foundation and, and uh, Cloud Native Compute. And, and like those specs are done there. So like what, what we've been doing 
is following a lot of the work of, of the lead of our, um, our head of decentralized identity, Daniel Buckner, who's been involved in these texts for about 10 years. And we've taken uh-huh. the, the best of, of all of these building blocks and use them to assemble the Web5 platform based on open standards. And then Web5 itself is, is also, those reference implementations are all also open source and open protocol. And the Web5 programming model is the same. Uh-huh. Yeah, I'm just, uh, there's a decentralized identifier as DID V1 spec. Yeah. From July 2022. And uh, so Web5 is implementing the spec. Another analogy to, you know, Enterprise Java back then, right? Uh, the decentralized identity spec? No, that uh, no, the, that the Web5 is a platform mm-hmm. which implements a standard. Yeah, it's imp- yeah, it's like bringing together several, actually. It's like reliant on several standards, yeah. So, like, the parallels that I see to, you know, an audience that may be familiar here with, like, the Enterprise Java background is entirely consistent, right? It's like all these building blocks for maybe smaller specs that are brought together into a cohesive whole in the same way that the Enterprise Edition was or on a smaller scale, something like EJB was. Mm-hmm. And and which standards are you s- or supporting, which are the most important maybe? So we have the DID, the, uh, we, we, what else? The DIDs, the Decentralized Web Nodes in, mm-hmm. in the Decentralized Identity Foundation, um, verifiable credentials for certain. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a spec called Wallet Rendering. This shows how we show, display, you know, visually display credentials. There's a wallet rendering spec as well. Uh-huh. And all of this stuff has to come together in a way that just makes it like, one, very, very easy for application developers to access and make apps. And two, honestly, like, I think that the privacy preserving elements of this are super important for a mass audience. I think that the paradigm and the details matter. But like, fundamentally, people don't use products unless they're just super easy to use and super easy to understand. So I'm hoping this paradigm of like throwing everything into your wallet and having ownership over it and showing the people that you want to show that to really resonates because that's how we've been transacting in business since way before the internet, right? That goes back hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, I really do view it as our job to make this as low barrier to entry as possible. What would be a killer app on Web5? Or the canonical Hello World app. Yeah. I mean, this, this to me is like more of a social question and a culture one than, than anything else, right? Like what Web5 opens up, what the simple idea of self-sovereignty opens up for us are use cases uh-huh. that are like, they just make things so much easier. I want everyone to think about how much time you spend like filling out information in a web form like your credit card information, your billing information, your shipping information. All of this can just be stored in your wallet as like a web extension and just like automatically go into whoever is asking for it. Like you could never have to input any of that again. Mm -hmm. When we make a decentralized exchange out of this, the killer app there is the ability to transact both like peer-to-peer and also do like value asset exchange, maybe US dollar for another nation's currency or US dollar for a cryptocurrency in an open exchange of competing players who are willing to do that, what we call a liquidity swap, right? Like changing Uh one asset class for another. That opens up a whole market of people able to compete. Unlike today where it's a centralized provider, you go, you make a bank account with them. That bank account is like individually regulated. And now you're using just them and, and their exchange. And by the way, if they're like holding on to those assets afterwards, if you're letting them custody those assets, they don't belong to you anymore. They belong, honestly, to the to the to the custodian, and they can use mm-hmm. that to settle business debts. And that's what that's what leads up to these crashes that we see every few years, and most recently with FTX, right? Like the, mm-hmm. that that retail risk to real people is a massive problem, and that is something that we can erase as well by helping to people again self custody stuff by throwing it in their own wallet. So there's all of these use cases, and when it comes to your question about like what's the killer app, I can confidently say I don't I don't know. And I don't uh-huh. think anyone does. Because in the way that like for instance we consume applications in the United States, it's not always a killer app. It's the killer social media app or the killer social media app for a particular purpose. And then there uh-huh. are many. 
But in other countries like in India and in China, like the idea of the super app is a much more culturally relevant one. And that's a whole bunch of things in one app that can do everything from chat to asset exchange to payments to ordering a taxi, right? Like these are the super apps and all of those things are possible over this communications protocol and better and more privacy preserving and easier to develop on once we've got that programming model. But in terms of like the killer app, I think this is this is why all of this is open source. It's to mm-hmm. leave it up to this grand global community to know that you are the experts over your business domain. And here, what we want to provide is the substrate for all of that communication to take place in a decentralized way, in a privacy preserving way, in a responsible way, in a way that moves the web forward. And now we want to in, like innovate with all of these app builders who have who have ideas, and we we know that we've given them good fundamentals. That's where our focus is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I I thought actually about killer use cases because uh, yeah. what you said, you know, the contact information and the uh, and the and the credit cards and 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 whatever it is actually needed. So usually you would use something like a password manager, right? So you have, to, of course, um, yeah. and, and you have trust the company. It's always, you know, the question uh, how secure it is and how how portable it is because, uh, you know, you can have a Mac, Linux, and, and Windows. Yeah. And uh, you would like to share maybe the password across the accounts. So I would say this would be one solution to the problem. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, uh, like a very, very simple to use password manager, hopefully. Yeah. Which uh, or identity manager, not password. There are no passwords anymore. Passwords are actually gone with that. But you know, identity manager, right? So this is why this would be like a, a password manager on steroids. I would say this would be one thing. And if you do this, I'm I'm just thinking, you know. Um, so I'm building lots of web apps, mm-hmm. and you could actually use the same technology, but instead using you know, um, REST to communicate with a central server. Mm-hmm. You could use your protocol to, uh, to yeah. exchange JSON messages, so the application would be exactly the same as before. The only difference is that uh, it is uh, more secure, and uh, and there is no central server. Yeah, I mean, look, it looked, we had this like really interesting meeting with our team like a few months ago too, and like we talked about exactly this, right? Like in my in my estimation of a, like a properly layered modular even if it's monolithic, but like a properly layered and like modular monolithic application, enterprise application, I've got all of my business logic probably exposed through like API calls that like make for the things I want to do. Uh, by the and way, I'm, you're always yeah. referring to enterprise app. We know what happened. I may, maybe I mentioned, yeah. this, uh, mentioned this a few years ago. So um, the the maybe you saw my, my, my talks, you know, I don't mm-hmm. know, five to 10 years ago. Yeah. Um, and uh, what I just wrote is a simple enterprise code. And now the uh, interesting part is we're actually running exactly the same code as AWS Lambda or Azure function. So uh, uh, you can actually pick this. It runs extremely fast. And uh, you can write, you know, in, with Java, um, big monolith with few hundred classes. Yeah. And uh, startup is good and it's cheap and it's very fast. So... Uh, I would say what you're thinking about you no know, big enterprise Java, you can still do this, um, but uh, it was actually over 10 years ago, so the code was r- really lean, and what Java comes with is very good performance. So what we are doing, we are running our old you know, enterprise apps written in pragmatic way as serverless functions. Yeah. So um, so uh, what uh, what I was referring to, to to the idea with the web components is, um, what we are doing more and more, we are sending, you know, one-way data to server and the data comes back via WebSockets. So this is, you know, a, a, a bi-directional asynchronous communication, which is JSON-based. So we are actually, this is um, for us, so I don't know if you're familiar with a typical web app. So you have a Redux store. You have um, usually some kind of state management. Redux, I just pick it. Redux because it's standard and, and very yeah. simple. And uh, whatever whatever changes the Redux, the entire page gets updated. So this is the basic idea. So you're pushing to the server, server updates your Redux store, and Redux store updates your page. So this is like mm-hmm. a unidirectional data flow. So now I could replace you know, my protocol with yours, and I have already a then decentralized app, uh, which just you know uses standard technology. I just use your messaging layer. 
Yeah. I mean, and that, that's exactly what I mean by like a properly structured, even if it's a monolith enterprise app, mm-hmm. is that you've got a layer that like, all right, that REST layer is one that you could pull out to make it serverless or Lambda. It's something like other people have pulled mm-hmm. out to make things more microservice based. Mm-hmm. Because you can pull it apart. In our case, it's taking it's taking what would be the like incoming restful layer and instead putting a decentralized what we call it a D web, decentralized web nodes message. Uh-huh. And that would now be your like that's your layer. Or you adapt your HTTP layer to it, right? Uh-huh. And and that's now like that's now your interface to the world is this messaging layer, you you comply with that contract. You use this messaging layer uh-huh. and translate it into your own APIs, and you're like you're good to go, right? That's that's the, the idea. So your messaging layer is basically asynchronous JSON mm-hmm. message mm-hmm. right? Yeah, just like you would open up an interface for a RESTful one or a WebSockets one or a JMS messaging or whatever, right? They're all they're all just interfaces to the world. Mm-hmm. And here's another one. Only the difference is this one gives you an interface into a decentralized network. Yeah, but from technological perspective, I, I, I mean, it's just JSON messages, right? Uh huh. I mean, as as an implementation, yeah. When you implement that layer, that's that's all it is, right? Because if you if you think about as all the cloud serverless stuff, it's all about mm-hmm. messages. Yeah. And the messages get consumed, you know, by functions or by uh, yep. yeah, by functions, lambdas. So I would say the tech, as my your platform is completely compatible with, uh, t- uh, from the architectural perspective, with you know my front ends and my serverless stuff I'm doing right now. Uh, as, as so um, I, I'm the killer app would be whatever we do right now with uh, the ability to be decentralized. So there is no single point of control, not failure mm-hmm. control because failure is a different story, but uh, control and. Yeah. Um, and what the what what's interesting the identity is solved hopefully right so uh, if I uh, send you my DID you know that's me so there is no question question about that because you are using blockchain for that and blockchain is you know the entire uh, chain of events signed so this is like very, very similar to Git right? I mean we, through through a technology called Ion we'd be would be anchoring the did on the on the Bitcoin blockchain. Just mm-hmm. the DID and all the information that you're that you're going through is is now like permissions based and through that JSON thing through your decentralized web nodes. So like if you wanted to like know me, cool, know me, you can know me through my DID. But like I'm also going to probably grant you access to my profile picture and my name and bio data and other stuff as mm-hmm. verifiable credentials that I'm going to like give you access to. Um, yeah, exactly. So, yeah, you know, so, so what it means if you yeah. build, um, maybe you are already know too deep. Uh, in your in your in your decentralized web, you know, to mm-hmm. to 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 answer my my simple simple questions, but no, <laughs> but uh, but um, what I'm thinking about immediately, right? So if my identity is like, uh, let's say, thousands of attributes, right? This could be whatever from my from my GitHub, you know, history to Twitter followers or whatever. It can be whatever yeah. I imagine. But I would like just, you know, to give you, because a social application, just my Twitter followers. So I can just permit your app just to see my Twitter followers. So I can look at my DIT and then you get uh, through my permissions. You can look up, you know, my Twitter followers and create an app, you know, social app, which just only sees the Twitter fo- followers, but not my credit card information, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, you yeah can, but this you is already can be cool, really right? fine grained with the information you want to provide. That's exactly because right. this yeah. is a kind of decentralized and centralized. But the truth is, now... Everything is decentralized. No, no. Everything is inconsistently decentralized because you know my Twitter followers on Twitter and GitHub is on GitHub, and they are I'm depending on on you know twenty companies. And now I would be depending on the and the network, not a single company, a network. But the information is actually centralized because it belongs to me. It's like inversion of control. Exactly. That's inversion exactly of control, right. like that's, that's exactly inversion right. of we've, we've inversion, inverted, inversion of control. Inversion of control. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Only now we've like inverted it back, right? Inversion of control was about like giving control to the container to like supply mm-hmm. you with what you need rather than you having to supply it. Here, here the control's back with you. So like, but that's exactly right. We've like inverted the control back and that's what the self-sovereignty is about. That's why SSI, self-sovereign identity and mm-hmm. the whole verifiable credentials model. Um, because that's exactly what it gives you. And, and again, like, I think we're we're not used to this. We've gotten really used to the whole like SSO world of like login with Google or login with Facebook or login with Twitter. 
You know, that uh-huh. what we've done there is we've trusted centralized providers with our data to kind of verify some aspect of our identity. This has been lauded as a like really big paradigm shift. It's one that's difficult for folks to understand. And the, the point I most want to impress is it's not. This, uh-huh. is a re- this is a return back to the identity model that we already know and use in the physical world. This is you holding your stuff and other people being able to give you things, give you credit cards, give you passports, driver's licenses, uh-huh. and you hanging on to them and being able to display them when you're asked to display them. Uh-huh. And it's the same thing right now, just in the digital world. And by the way, instead of backed with holograms or physical cards, it's now backed with cryptographic integrity. Then it's similar to the solid, princ- uh, not principal, solid uh, project mm-hmm. from Tim Berners-Lee, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. For, I mean, you know, for certain, like, like Tim Berners-Lee is also been, like with solid, like recognize that like identity is an essential part of the, like the decentralized web and we need to build that in. Um, mm-hmm. so, if, you, if you want to talk to Daniel about that too, again, like Daniel Buckner, like our head of decentralized identity, he's been involved in this space for a decade. And yeah, been, I'm more uh, interested in the opportunities, and 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 yeah. I think it, everything goes already a little bit in the direction. Of, um, the uh, you no, know, the um, Apple sign in effort. This what, how it's called an Apple key. You know, these the uh, and um, so you can sign in. You know, without password to to the websites. But this is a very early. So uh, this is actually there's not an Apple product. It's just Fido uh, mm-hmm. compliant login. But uh, it is not. It is. It is not. That decentralized as, as you are doing, but and at least you know the uh, users get custom to such a thing that yeah. they say, okay, this is a usual way. I don't need username and password. My identity is my identity. Yeah, and uh, yeah, users get a coast like they get they get used to that paradigm, which is good because I think the second like people see this, it's just going to be intuitive. We're just going to kind of like get it. Um, the difference to me between that and like what we're building is that it is being done. It's an open protocol. It's remarkably important. Like. You asked about the apps that we want to build. We recognize that like this doesn't work for Block. This doesn't work for my company, for TBD as a product. It just doesn't. We're, we're asking to be transacting with banks around the world, with people. We're asking to be sharing parts of identity. This demands to be a public good. It demands to be an open protocol. Because if it's not, then where's the collaboration model that gives everyone a chance to plug in and find their own shared value for this? This needs to be something that everyone can derive value on. And no one will trust. If this is not open, it will die. And this, Right, exactly that. So we're not trying to draw a moat around this. We're not trying to like bolster ex- like exactly one product line and be the, the central point through which all commerce transacts or all data does. And we find a way to take that and monetize it and use it for ad revenue or whatever. Like, that's none of that. It is, this demands to be a public good because it's just not feasible as as an idea if it's not and Uh we know that like as a business that's going to open up so much opportunity that we can monetize that in any number of ways that provide real value that welcomes people to the economy and we will okay yeah so then is the web 5 is similar somehow to java Mm -hmm. right or j2e I mean, you know, in my mind, but like, hey, look, that's where I, that's where I come from, right? Like, we all see the world through. Our no, I mean, lenses. I mean the also the economics, but, because what mm-hmm. you are interested in is to building an open standard and not yeah. necessary to. And you will probably have a reference implementation of Web five, yeah, like the you know the block one, mm-hmm. and, but yeah, exactly. other providers could implement something else, and only like, if totally. you get you know enough implementations. It mm-hmm. becomes more valuable, you know, for because only one implementation is kind of boring. Totally. Decentralized web node comes with uh, like a storage model and a messaging model and a, like a whole protocol behind it. And like we are making under like under Web5, which is which is definitely a TBD thing. That's a project that we steward. It's, it's uh-huh. open source, but it's a project that we steward. Oh, okay. And we have we have a, and we have an implementation, right? It's, we have a, a TypeScript and JavaScript implementation of decentralized web nodes. And that's mm-hmm. one implementation, and it does not need to be the only one. Just okay. like just like with Java EE, right? Okay. So for which yeah. company are you working? Actually, are you working for Block for for Block because there is no more Square, I think, and and uh, or exactly. is TBD is an is is also a company? No. Yeah, TBD is a business unit under Block. Block oh, is okay. a publicly traded company, right? So under Block is a uh, is now it is what is now called Square, which is the payments mechanism that most people are familiar with. Mm-hmm. There's Cash App. Uh-huh. Right, the peer-to-peer, right, uh-huh. uh, number one finance app in the app store. 
There's Tidal, the music streaming service, and there's us, TBD. Okay. And we all focus on economic empowerment in various ways. And that's what that brings us together at Block. So this makes sense country. because, you no, know, Squ- yeah. Square as a payment provider, I mean, this is the next big thing. And, in, in, mm-hmm. you know, you, you have to, to, to know what's going on, right? So from the architecture perspective, it makes sense. And this is the way to go because uh, if you are centralized, I mean, then, then it's a completely different story, you know, that people, the, the, your clients have trust you is this completely different model and if you are mm-hmm. decentralized and the protocol is open you can actually actually identical to java j2e right the the, the the idea was that the server are competing you know regarding the non-functional requirements and not necessarily that the http is working right so mm-hmm. this was forgiven that http and dependency injection and and in and, and the garbage collection or whatever we we did configuration garbage collection not but configuration and it just worked and this is also in your case. So we say, okay, the basic th- things have to work and, and, and block will provide or TBD will provide added value, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, and it's, yeah, it's in a lot of ways, the same model that you and I are familiar with from Enterprise Java and, and honestly from like how Red Hat has spun a lot of this stuff too, right? Mm-hmm. Like just open yeah. by default company, gives it there, finds value added services and does a massive job like, you know, just monetize yeah but that. red hat was different because what red hat mm-hmm. did is they they had lots of you know um open source projects mm-hmm. and uh and uh there was the the commercial projects and the the upstream projects mm-hmm. but it was not like they always created standard right so uh this is uh like a key cloak is uh, you can say okay it's almost a standard mm-hmm. but it's a product as so an open source product and there's an i think red hat identity platform mm-hmm. whatever it's called is the commercial yeah. Uh, key cloak, but there is no, but there is no key cloak spec. This is just an open source product. And what seems here is that uh, y- you are following Web three C standards first, implementing the standards as an open source solution. And maybe there will be a product, right? So this is this is very similar to Java E, and maybe you know you could compare then Block or TBD to Red Hat. This this is comparable then. I think I I honestly think the comparison holds up. Like when you say Keycloak, like there's a bunch of standards that are embedded within Keycloak. The Keycloak hey, is okay. supported. Right? So if if you consider right, Keycloak as yeah. a standard, you're right. So you could say you know okay. open well, ID no, connect. Hold on. And I'm, all I'm considering mm-hmm. Keycloak as a project, right? Mm-hmm. Like Keycloak is a project. It has a whole bunch of like foundational technologies that are standards it's implementing, and then is innovating beyond that to bring all of that stuff together. And that's not a standard, and that's fine. Mm-hmm. In Web five. We've got like, for instance, like we have um, a self-sovereign identity server and mm-hmm. that also uses a whole bunch of standards, things like DIDs, VCs, verifiable credentials, decentralized identifiers, right? It brings these things in, but the ways that it's pre- like presenting a user interface or is doing operations for those is left unspecified and that's driven by the project itself. Mm-hmm. And that project but- also like rolls up into Web5, right? Like... Yeah, but Keycloak is like too narrow, right? Uh, because you already mm-hmm. mentioned uh, you, have, you have the identity, you have permissions, you have storage nodes, you have you have the uh, the the web no web nodes. Um, forgot the name. The foundation uh, decentralized nodes. How, how what's his name? D- D- yeah, decentralized web nodes. D- yeah, yeah, exactly. Decentralized mm-hmm. web nodes. Mm-hmm. And this is more like you know if if you compare it to Java E, as I see uh, immediately parallels. Uh, Keycloak is there uh, too narrow, you know, because it's always only about identity authentication authorization. And um, but Keycloak is, but our but our self sovereign identity server kind of does the same type of stuff in you know adapted for a decentralized identity. But world. messages, you do more, right? You you can exchange messages, and this is uh, uh, out of scope of Keycloak, I would say. Um, yeah, but the descent. I mean, again, like the the server, the the self sovereign identity server is also going to like be plugged into something that is going to be able to send those things over messages as well, in the same way that like Keycloak is. I guess. Like they're they're clearly not the same thing, and like we probably shouldn't get like caught up in a like a no just just for understanding or, because I, yeah. I think is the messaging the storage part also of TBD or just the identity the messaging yeah the messaging and the storage is part of something called decentralized web nodes that's a spec that's the spec that's in the decentralized identity foundation and we at TBD have a reference implementation of yeah that. Yeah. yeah well this is exactly mm-hmm. white, like Whitefly right so you have the the, the Identity server. Yeah. This would mm-hmm. be more or less for me, Keycloak or part of the Java e security spec. Yeah, mm-hmm. and 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 the messaging is more like JMS and storage. Let's say more like JDBC JPA. So this is a uh, this is yep. wider than Keycloak, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's like comprehensive, kind of like the whole stack. 
The whole stack. Which is why I call them like, which is why I return to that word enterprise. Because to me, like when I hear enterprise, I don't hear big and heavy. I hear all of the things that you need as an application developer Uh to be able to responsibly do business without having to worry about those cross-cutting concerns, right? Uh Messaging protocols and transactional boundaries and security and whatever. That stuff should all just be baked into the programming model of whatever you're using. And that's why I believe that Web5 is, is a very important thing for the So the, the Hello World app should be then Twitter, you know? Because in mind, this is, <laughs> if you think about this, because uh, identity... There, there are folks, thing? yeah, like there are folks that are building that kind of stuff right now. There, there are folks in a company called Zion and they're they're building, they've been building a social network on top of Web5. And there, there are others who are building them on other decentralized protocols as well. Is it the killer mm-hmm. app? I don't know. But you know, it is. Hello world. It is. You know, just hello world because you know identity in Twitter mm-hmm. was always a problem in social networks, and um, and uh, yeah. yeah, you have storage, you have messages. So storage and um, exchanging messaging messages very important. You know, even even in case of Mastodon, so if you know this activity pop protocol, which you know where the messages mm-hmm. are ex- uh, exchanged between nodes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Interesting. I, I mean. Kill app not from you know from uh, from maybe p- business perspective because <laughs> Twitter I think uh, was not that uh, or is not that you know yeah. that um, profitable right now but uh, from from hello world perspective I mean interesting yeah yeah and and what are you are doing actually are you coding or uh, what what's your role now at TBT I'm now what we call the head of open source programs. I oh, report cool. to the, like the head of the business unit, and and that's to signify like the importance of open source in this, the importance of making this as an open protocol and uh-huh. getting this out there. So you know, in open source programs, we work really closely with. You know, we have a dedicated open source engineering team that does engineering in open source, and what we want to do is be building ecosystem around this, making sure uh-huh. that we're getting enough of these foundational techs out there released with some guides for how to use them get people excited and like show them exactly what they can do with this and we need then a java implementation this you want a java implementation yeah and the java implementation wrapper around around the messages too so you can use that like natively in java and not have to like you know spin your own i mean like think think of like http early on like that's how i think of the the dweb messages is it's right like they're they're just json and they're just in some kind of format but so is http and like http is so old and has all this like yeah. library support that like you no one ever writes http right like you you only like it's embedded in something that's in like a servlet request in a servlet engine or something like that but like so that's that's let's those be a are the next bit, steps yeah let's be be a li- little bit more technical if, mm-hmm. if if we can if not sure. uh, just say no so yeah. um I, I would like to send you a message yeah a hello hello andrew message mm-hmm Regardless with what, which which TypeScript is very similar to Java or whatever, mm-hmm. how this looks like. So, how what would be the code? Is this like you know, look up my identity or what? What I have to do with your platform to yeah. send you Andrew a hello Andrew message? All embedded in the emerging DW the decentralized web like node spec. And right now, like even our team is working on the like APIs with which to do that. So it's a TypeScript SDK uh-huh. that you can either like bring in and uh-huh. use that SDK to send those messages and do it in there, or go and take a look at the spec as Adley, which by the way is also continually evolving, uh-huh. and see like how to send those. But there is a, there's a prescribed way to construct what exactly those messages look like and how to send them. So uh-huh. it would either be using you know for right now using the SDK where we give library support behind that, or like. Uh-huh following in the spec just like it is in http right yeah uh, do you know yeah. this is udp is this tcp ip something has to to be behind the scenes or oh yeah but those are i mean those are like transport layer like protocols yeah. right so like, like yeah i mean we this is this is an application layer protocol mm-hmm. so we may leave that like the transport layer unspecified oh, okay so i could mm-hmm. use a uh, transport layers unspecified it could be whatever so we can actually use the messaging over http I mean, yeah, this is like something we've been talking about on the team a lot too, is like, you know, can we like wrap this in HTTP just to like make it super easy for people? But there are like, there are things about that that make it kind of sticky. And honestly, like they, they raise questions in my mind and we're all still kind of like working through it too. For instance, like HTTP is bound to the web. And so like, we need to recognize a few things. One, the internet is decentralized and two, the web is not, the web is centralized. So there are things that are like baked into HTTP that make it centralized. Things like 
um, like session IDs and other things that like talk about the communication between you as a client and the server in that mm -hmm. exact interaction. Mm -hmm. And in a decentralized world, you're not sending a request to a server. You're sending a request into a network. Mm -hmm. So any of that like authentication type information is totally inappropriate. You know, like, authentication like stuff, those authentication headers are like totally inappropriate in a decentralized world because you're not authenticating in that way to one server. It's just not how it works. So like, there's a lot of HTTP that like you could use as a porting layer between the two, but mm -hmm. there is some stuff that makes HTTP representatively like centralized by definition and has to be rethought if you're going to put a decentralized comms over HTTP as a protocol. Yes and no, right? Because if yeah. you would use, yeah, I mean, of course, if you, I mean, if you use no HTTP with DNS, right? And uh, there can yeah. be a multiple service behind, but at the end of the day, this is, the DNS. And uh, what I understanding is, uh, in your decentralized world, I would just send a message to the system without saying anything about the server. And uh, the routing happens elsewhere, right? I would use your DID or whatever that that whoever is or whatever is behind the scenes, it will get the message and route the message to you, right? Yeah, but there are things that we do put in HTTP headers that are like remarkably inappropriate in a decentralized world and need to be handled like elsewhere. So like really, we think about not putting them in the header and putting them into the like the body of the message because all these messages, the critical part of them is that like all these messages have to be replayable. You've got to be able to like take a message and replay them to like any n number of relays or and like destinations. And that that message all has to like at all points in time and to all parties be consistently appropriate. Um, and there are just enough cases like embedded within the, you know, in HTTP where that's not the case. Now you can do a couple things. You can like use the parts of HTTP you want and then strip away the authorization and the whatever other stuff mm -hmm. there is. But like, all right, that's kind of HTTP-esque, but not really HTTP and like... Mm -hmm. You know, we're getting like maybe in the weeds about this, but these to me are like the very interesting parts about the differences between um, a decentralized world and a centralized one and has to like really make a step back and inspect all of the like massive ecosystem attachment and how commonly understood HTTP is as like a like a it's an application protocol, but it's kind of a transport one, right? Because people write their own app protocol yep. over it. Like that's so a saying your well message is thing. Cash, right? And, like, yeah, it's exactly right. So, um, okay, okay. So it means that uh, you can you can uh, send the, the same message multiple times, of course, because if it's signed, you get exactly the same hash. So it shouldn't matter how, how often you send the same message because it will recognize it's already duplicate, right? Yeah, it's like I mean, you you should be able to expect the same action. I mean, item potence is something that I that I used to use a lot when doing like java messaging and the idea there was that like no matter what message you send you always got back like the reliable mm -hmm. response this one to me is more about like no matter at what point in time i send it i want it to be received by like no matter what party in exactly the right way so there can be nothing about the message itself in the message that is like unique to an inter-party interaction and that's not just not how the centralized web works when i send a message to google.com I'm expecting to communicate with Google.com, not the Web5 network of whoever is who's listening to this. Yeah, but uh, it reminds me a little bit how NoSQL databases are working because if you send mm -hmm. a message to a NoSQL node, yeah. you send to the node, but the node will, could say, no, 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 um, let's say Cassandra or the other node, or, yeah. or um, um, I'm actually um, not in charge of this, me uh, me of this um, uh, to handle this message because of consistent yeah. hashing. And will reroute, you know, the message to the proper node. So something like mm -hmm. this is already decentralized. And uh, you, because what I'm wondering, right, you have to use a kind of a protocol. I mean, the closest would be UDP, right? Yeah, I mean, like when it comes to like the transport protocols, and it, it's this is, I mean, these are honestly the areas where things we're gonna have like have to figure them out a little bit, like as we go forward, right? Yeah. Like we're still we're still putting out our first reference implementation of this. We want to get people building on it. We want to yeah, but the reference implementation you already have to have something, right? Yeah, yeah, well, you need to have something, and you need to have something working. But like, it's also, I mean, you and I both know you put something out into the world, and then like you start to see all the ways that they like want to use it, and like, you know, hey, it would be better if instead of thinking about this, 
in this way, we can adapt it into this existing architecture we've got. So what does that look like? And these are the types of questions we get to specifically when we get into like HTTP as a, as a protocol. I, I thought you know a lot because um, during, during the, the talk, because there, there are already technologies at some microsystems back then, which are similar somehow. Yes. I don't know whether you are aware of a project called JXTA, J-X-T-A, Juxtapose, Juxta.org. JXTA. So it was peer-to-peer -peer protocol. Mm -hmm. And um, it's no more around. This was some microsystems time. Uh, of course, Java implementation back then. Yeah. And and what uh, you, you could send, you know, a message to a peer. And there were so-called Walker and uh, and and uh, the message got replicated to the closest nodes, but yeah. it was completely decentralized. And it was called Juxtapose because, you know, uh, you did, uh, there was uh, even Project Paper, Paper Airplane, I think, oh, where it was yeah. like, you know, decentralized browser. It was in the year 2004, I think, or five. And uh, then was Genie, which was uh, not that decentralized, but similar. So for instance, Genie, this is what I ask, you know, how to how to communicate with the nodes. In Genie, you would say, uh, I, I need discovery service, and you get discovery service, and you have to lease the service every few seconds, otherwise it would disappear. And then you'd use this service to communicate just to send a message. And, um, and the protocol was uh, RMI, but you could plug whatever you liked. So it was also a similar story to yours and of course um uh, java spaces was like a hash map which was decentralized so this is how it how it started java genie and java spaces yeah and this were they were interesting technologies so this is why what i know, ask you know what what he did once with the jack jackster idea it was um a, so a car was a node a, a jackster node you know if, if you go to or the on the highway and there was a traffic jam, so the car could talk to a car, and uh, and and you know recognize whether there is a traffic jam or not. It was completely decentralized because every car was you know like a car. If the if the if the car if the cars were close to each other, you could communicate from car to a car without having you know central central uh, tower or whatever. So. Um, yeah. Yeah, th this was what what I thought the entire time. You know, um what protocols to use and how it works. So this was these were my questions because I was involved in similar projects back then, but it was uh, a long time ago. Yeah, I mean, what's interesting about this conversation to me is that like when people look at this, they can kind of squint and like pull something from their background and be like, "This looks kind of like it's familiar, right?" Mm -hmm. The idea of like decentralized text being so, um, like so innovative and so paradigm shifting that they rewrite everything that we know. I think it's something we've got to like get away from a little bit. Certainly the paradigm shift opens up a whole bunch of use cases that we weren't able to do before. And certainly it lets us do it in a more like privacy preserving way. But when it comes down to the, the architecture itself, like by my estimation, a decentralized network is an implementation of a distributed network, which is an implementation of kind of centralized ones. And there are bits and pieces that we've like created throughout computer science and computer architecture and through like protocols that we can use to like pull this together. And we shouldn't forget that, I think, as we're like constructing these solutions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. It was nice to chat with you. I'm really, really curious. Good to catch up. Yeah. What do you do in two years? You know that. Yeah, me too. That that'll be like. It, Not that you're saying. You know, like now we years. are we are in centralized. <laughs> we're back. You know, this decentralized right. it never works. So now we have to be centralized again. All right. So it could happen, yeah. right? In two years, I expect we're going to have like a massive network of all sorts of people bringing their brilliant ideas and innovation. And a lot more Java, network. right? So we're not some and speed lot and more Java. yeah. No, no. <laughs> well, that's why we're protocol agnostic, man. Like we got to, you know. Yeah. We need Java, Java connectors. I, think, I hope every language has a connector in here to make this as easy as possible mm -hmm. to partake in the network. And I, I expect we're going to be seeing that over the next couple of years. Absolutely. Cool. Where mm -hmm. people can find you? You can in find centralized me on, and centralized yeah. and in decentralized <laughs> web. Now in two you modes. Can, you can you can still find me on the uncentralized web on Twitter at, at AL Rubinger for some And is it possible to here. find you on a decentralized web already? Not yet, but soon enough. <laughs> the, we will see on your in centralized. You will announce, you know, in your centralized web, you know, where you yeah, are. Yeah, I'll announce. The, I'll announce where I'm going. Yeah, I've been playing around with like a few of the decentralized like like networks there, but I've got to find like the one that I want to like get married to, or maybe the several. I don't know. I'm still figuring out my way too, as we all are, I think. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. It was fun. Thank you. Thank you, Adams. Good seeing you. <laughs>